Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Geographical Society's um, celebration of the Earth Day. Um, and hopefully we'll celebrate today and many more days. As I'm admitting people, I would like to welcome all of you. Um, our panelists are um, member of the society, Tim Kerner, who will be our uh, moderator tonight. I am Dilek D. Karabucak. I'm the executive director of the organization. And it's been my pleasure to be with the society for the past almost three years now. And as we um, try to bring you these types of events, um, some related to travel, some related to exploration and um, any ideas, thoughts you may have, please share them with us. And you can visit our website at geographicalsociety.org. Um, you can message me, um, you can call me and um, we'll, we'll adapt our programs according to your wishes. And again, according to our vision and uh, mission statement, we're about people, places, perspectives. We've been exploring since 1890 almost 130 years. So um, tonight we have a great panel list, I mean, a uh, uh, panel discussion with great uh, participants. And without further ado, I will pass the word to um, Tim Kerner. Timothy, our, um, again, uh, member of the society. Tim, please go ahead. Thanks, Dee, and hello, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Uh, first, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists that we have. Carol Collier is the Director of the Environmental Studies and Sustainability Program at Drexel University and a Senior Advisor of Watershed Management and Policy at the Academy of Natural Sciences. She also served for over 15 years as the Executive Director of the Delaware River Basin Commission. We have Garth Connor. He's an environmental scientist at the EPA and performs environmental inspections in a variety of industrial sectors for the Enforcement and Compliance Division in Philadelphia. And Garth participates regularly in legal negotiations and enforcement settlements with the industrial facilities. And Kate Schmidt serves as the communication specialist for the Delaware River Basin Commission and is responsible for the DRBC's public information and outreach efforts. She serves as a DRBC representative on the Delaware River Sojourn Steering Committee, which plans and leads the annual Delaware River Sojourn. Thank you to our panelists for coming and thanks for each of you for attending on our Earth Day. I'm going to uh, start our presentation by giving a brief, broad brushstroke introduction to the Delaware River to set the stage for our panel discussion. So I'm gonna share my screen, open this and then open this, whoops. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, all right. So we're gonna start with a map, not the map uh, you were probably thinking of that relates to the Delaware River, but this map is important because it actually shows the origin of a lot of the character that we have around the Delaware River. And this is Pangaea, which was the supercontinent prior to the breakup of the continents that we all recognize today. And what's interesting about it is this band of brown that running diagonally. This is, the, this is showing the Appalachian Mountains that at the time were about the height of the Himalayas. Uh, you can see that they're running past the equator. So they're a tropical version of the Himalayas. If we were to find where Philadelphia is currently, you'd be right about here, just a little bit above the equator. So if you think our summers are hot now, it was quite a bit hotter back then. And if you think that's a distant part of the past, it's uh, not really so. It's this, our Pennsylvania map is like a manuscript of all those forces of intercontinental collision and separation. The Appalachian Mountains were formed when the future Africa crashed into the future uh, North America. And so you see the, these, this diagonal striping that you may have wondered why we have this shape, it's basically reflecting the edges of those two coastlines which collided into each other about 300 million years ago. Pangaea existed for about 100 million years. But the mountain, the mountain chain of the Appalachians actually formed from about four different mountain origines, uh, but the Appalachian origin being the most recent one. So on this map, you see the, the various heights um, 
of Pennsylvania, and you also see the rivers. So right in the middle, you see the Susquehanna, and you'll note that it's been busy uh, removing some of the mountain and carrying it down outward to the Chesapeake Bay and into the ocean. In the upper north uh, west corner, a little bit of this part of Pennsylvania flows out into Lake Erie. And most of the western half all makes, makes its way down to Pittsburgh and then out along the Ohio River to the Mississippi eventually and down to the Gulf. And then you have the Delaware, which is bordering the, uh, the edge of Pennsylvania. So we have to shift our focus over a little bit to see our watershed that we we're talking about. So that pinkish area is all the land that drains into the Delaware River, which runs along the middle. And you can see that uh, the topography, which basically shapes that basin, uh, although it would be wrong to think that first the land forms and then the water flows as a result. In fact, the Delaware River and the other major rivers along the East Coast predate the, the mountains that it flows through. So there is interaction of the water with the mountains, even as they form. And the, this, these are two diagrams that show general aspects about rivers. This is not specifically about the Delaware, but there are two different aspects that these diagrams will tell us. One in the upper right, just all the, all the animals that depend upon the Delaware or any river. So life form, forms around and depends upon those waters. So the, uh, as the water flows, all those various animals uh, rely upon it. So it is a, an organizer or a system of life that forms around the river. But the bottom, the bottom diagram shows us that the river doesn't, uh, it's not just one ecological region. It forms, it flows through various ecological regions. In general, up, it begins up in the mountains, flows through the, the lowlands of the mountains, and then finally out to the plains. And each of these land areas uh, can be considered an ecological region with its own characteristics of climate, landform, soil type, vegetation. So the land and the soil, which is within the land, uh, will dictate what types of plants can grow, which will then lead towards the types of animals that can grow. So there are different ecological regions are tied um, that, and the water runs through those ecological regions. And the Delaware region, uh, there are four different ecological regions that it makes its way through. Beginning up in the upper Appalachian plateaus, there's two branches that form in the Catskills and then they make their way down to the Valley and Ridge region, also called the Ridge and Valley region, which is the area still within the Appalachian Mountains, but a, a particular area of ridges and folds that uh, in this particular area is known for its anthracite uh, coal. And then a little further down is the Piedmont region and these Appalachian and Piedmont regions, they flow, they, they, they go all the way down through hundreds of miles and end up in Alabama. These are the, the, the Appalachian mountain ranges. And then finally you get down to the coastal plain in around the Delaware and then out out to the Atlantic. And each of these being the different ecological areas, each with their own type of vegetation, their own animals, so uh, very different um, areas that the, the river will flow through. Going back to the map of Pennsylvania, this is a, a somewhat gentler map, but you see the uh, more closely the, inter, the interconnection of the land and the water. And you see again the, the Appalachian Plateau, which works diagonally and then down through many states, the Valley and Ridge area in between the, the upper Appalachians, and then down in the Piedmont areas, the lowlands of the, of the Appalachians. And then down at the bottom, you see Philadelphia in a circle and the coastal plains along there. Again, Delaware, the Delaware River is skirting the, the edge of the state. This circle represents a particularly interesting uh, interaction of, of water and land. You see this ribbon of land, which separates the counties, is actually Blue Mountain or Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Mountain, which is considered the first major ridge of the Appalachians. And you can see the very dramatic occurrence as the river cuts through it. Uh, there are at least three different theories as to how the river made its way through this this um, major um, 
blockage. You can see the river running, up, running along the northwest edge of the mountain, and then it cuts through and down. And this is obviously, if you haven't guessed already, the Delaware Water Gap. Here's another view of it. Uh, this was actually the site of a planned dam. The idea was to dam this up, and then the, the, the water would flood throughout this area. And then that would be a, an opportunity for hydroelectric power and, and drinking water. Uh, but due to the opposition of many um, and the, the, idea, the desire to preserve the natural beauty of this area and also uh, the technical difficulties, it was eventually abandoned. But all that land that the federal government had amassed uh, with the idea of making a, a, a lake in this area became the, became the national park, which is which is the Delaware water gap that we know today. So the Delaware River is unique in that it's the longest uh, river to the east of the Mississippi, which is not dammed along its length, uh, but there are many reservoirs uh, throughout the Delaware watershed, and each of these is a, is a reservoir which is being identified. And this is important because uh, the Delaware River watershed um, it's about 15,000 mi square miles, which represents uh, about a half percent of all the land area of the country. But the population that it serves in terms of drinking water, including New York City, uh, because the Catskill Reservoir is actually, the water is brought down through to New York City, but it serves a population of 17 million people that rely on its drinking water. So obviously reservoirs are scattered about. And this means a very intense reliance upon the water. And this intensity of human, human use makes, uh, is obviously uh, very taxing upon the natural life and systems in and around the water. But to represent a, a greater intensity of use is this map of the Pennsylvania Railroad, this network of rails, which is uh, centered around Philadelphia. And you can see in and around uh, the, the Delaware River uh, and obviously a very intense use of land with great impact upon the waterways. And again, another network and completely independent but overlapping network of the Reading Railroad. Um, and then obviously in and around Philadelphia and spreading out along the, De the Delaware. And the Reading Railroad um, was uh, moving all kinds of freight and passengers, but also especially moving anthracite out of the mountains of, of Pennsylvania and out to the river to be uh, brought uh, across the East Coast and out to the world to, So the anthracite coal is basically powering the uh, industrial revolution and industrial and many industries uh, throughout the country and the world. And here we see just the enormity of Port Richmond at the height of its use with 20 different piers uh, transferring coal uh, from, from train to ship. And this, and here is a map from 1916 of what is basically a, a huge machine of transference of, of the anthracite from the mountains. In some way, you could say that uh, humans and the river were working together to take the mountain out from, from the land and into the water. And this particular map is interesting because overlaid over this 1916 map is this little area highlighted in yellow. And what that is, is an archeological site and it was an archaeological site because it was a dig when they were uh, planning on moving I-95, which is now in progress. And prior to moving the streets over um, by federal law, there had to be a dig to find out if what types of archaeological objects could be found. And thousands were found uh, dating back um, through the centuries, uh, many historic artifacts from the uh, 18th and the, into the 17th century, and then earlier as well. On the right hand side is uh, an amulet that was worn by a uh, Lenny Lenape woman from prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Uh, so uh, it's somewhat ironic that one of the most intense industrial uses of the land actually led to the saving of, of archaeological objects. And here's um, a woman uh, from the Lenny Lenape tribe also uh, refers to themselves as the Delaware tribe in recognition of, of the river. Uh, they lived in and among the river for, not in, but around the river for uh, over 10,000 years. Until the Europeans came, it took about 100 years for their population to plummet by about 80% due to uh, 
uh, disease and conflict, and they were unfortunately eventually forced out of the state almost entirely. And most of the descendants of the Lenny Lenape people now live in Oklahoma. And here is the remains of, of Port Richmond as it looks today. Uh, the Reading Railroad uh, went into bankruptcy after the, the price of coal fell after World War II. Uh, Pennsylvania Railroad also did a few tricky maneuvers and led to the uh, Reading's demise. The tracks were removed and we have this area of 225 acres of, of land which um, Nothing has been specifically done, but the but nature has been at work uh, reclaiming the area. And we have what we come refer to now as Graffiti Pier, and we're looking at the remains of a, a coal transfer facility. This was a coal dumper through the trees. Um, and you see Philadelphia beyond, a somewhat uh, poetic photograph. Uh, what is misleading about this uh, photograph is that the trees are actually not growing on land, they are growing on the dirt that is accumulated on a concrete pier. So we see just the, the power of nature if left alone to, to, to regrow in these areas of, of devastation. Um, and this is just a particularly interesting site that has, uh, despite the fact has been uh, repeatedly fenced off and the fence is repeatedly opened up again because it, it has become somewhat of a, uh, a site of rogue expression and uh, informal art gallery, uh, Instagram spectacle, and a place of interaction between these industrial ruins, nature, and, and the human population. So that's my brief introduction to the river. So we, we have what we have, the forest is um, uh, the Delaware River, the result of violent forces, unstoppable flows of water, um, toxic industries, um, nature and unquenchable thirst. So obviously with all these elements and the intensity of its use, as well as the uh, well, both fragility and the aggressiveness of, of some of the natural aspects, uh, not an easy thing to manage among the four different states uh, which are involved in its, um, in its management. So our panelists today are going to uh, discuss uh, just what it takes to, to care for this river or to interact with this river um, in an appropriate manner. And first, we're going to hear from Kate, who will discuss the role of the Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, as well as the mission of the Delaware River Sojourn. So, Kate. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see that? And can everybody hear me okay? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kate Schmidt. I am the communication specialist for the Delaware River Basin Commission. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about how we briefly in 15 minutes or so, 15. So I'm gonna do a lot of, um, you know, if you remember Seinfeld and they had the whole thing where it was like yada, 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 and then this happened. We might go through some of that today, um, just given our time restraints, because the story, as we all know, um, is very important. And, you know, and we can always, we could all talk about it, um, all of the panelists forever. So here today, I just wanted to say from all of us at DRBC to all of you, happy Earth Day. We um, are all still working remotely. So we um, put together a, a Zoom um, of meeting, so we were able to to send this message out and, and get a nice screenshot of that. So happy Earth Day. And Tim gave us a great introduction uh, to the Delaware River and to the Delaware River Basin. And, you know, we use the term watersheds, basins, a little bit interchangeably, but really think of a basin as a as a large watershed. So a watershed is simply all of the land that drains to a body of water. And on the map on the left, you can see the Delaware River Basin um, outlined here in the black. And then all of these different colored areas are some of the larger or main sub watersheds of the Delaware River Basin. And when I explain watersheds to people, I always use the analogy of nesting dolls. So think of a basin as the largest watershed and it's made up of a lot of smaller watersheds. 
So here, the farthest smallest one might be the little creek or stream by your house, which flows into a bigger creek or stream, into a, maybe into a bigger river, and eventually everything flows here into the large Delaware River. And a couple facts, um, not to go over again what Tim mentioned, but the Delaware River itself is 330 miles long. It starts up here in Hancock, New York, for where the west and the east branch meet. And then it flows and it does create the border between the four states all the way down to the Delaware Bay where it meets the Atlantic Ocean. It is an interstate boundary its entire length. And it is the longest undammed river east of the Mississippi. So while there are dams on the tributaries, there are none on the main stem. The river is tidal up to Trenton, New Jersey. So there is a tidal influence for 133 miles. So the river is tidal past Philadelphia and then all past Bristol and all the way up to Trenton. And the largest tributary to the Delaware River is the Schuylkill River. And its second largest tributary is the Lehigh River, which flows in right here. The Delaware River Basin um, is small, as Tim mentioned, but it is mighty and it supports the water needs for over 13 million people. Um, it drains 13,539 square miles in the four states of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And every day, 6.4 billion gallons are withdrawn from the river for various needs. Some of those needs are to support the water needs um, of communities outside of the Delaware River Basin. So here you'll see a diversion to New York City, and there is also a diversion to parts of northern New Jersey. Those diversions support about 5 million people, and there's about 8 million plus that live in the basin. And the basin is also a workhorse. We like to refer to it as it, the river and the basin is living and working. It generates about $25 billion in annual economic activity. And these population figures are from 2016. So when we talk about the basin and we talk about water management, um, because the river is shared and is an interstate boundary, that shared resource creates shared problems. Um, and in the early to mid 1900s, those problems were becoming really, really prevalent. Um, we've had severe pollution in the river and its major tributaries, especially around Philadelphia, water supply shortages and disputes over um, who's going to get or use the basin's water. And there was also some serious flooding in 1955 that, um, you know, that really was um, a disastrous event on the river. And this uh, editorial cartoon is from 1937, the Philadelphia Record. And you can see you have um, men in the middle drinking their drinks in Philadelphia. And the headline is water, water everywhere, but not a drop fit to drink. Mm -hmm. So while we could also talk about water, so the, the water supply shortage issue and the flooding issue, I'll touch briefly on them. We're really gonna kind of focus on the pollution issue today. So here's a picture of the river um, in Philadelphia. It's from the Philly Water Department. And you can see, obviously, in the early 1900s, you know, as Tim mentioned too, with the railroads and as transport, it was, you know, the river was really an industrial and working river. Um, and, um, it, you know, there, because of that, we had a lot of serious problems. And, you know, for poor water quality was one of the main ones. We, you know, at this time of, you know, of our, in our country, there was really no sewage treatment and the rivers were always pretty much looked at as the dumping ground. If you needed to get rid of something, just put it in the river. So here's a, a picture on the left of slaughterhouse discharges in 1928. And then we have fish kills um, that happened. Um, and this one is also from 1929 from an oil spill. And there is the challenge. So how do you work together? We have four states, there are multiple agencies, 42 counties, eight, over 800 municipalities. And then you also have New York City who does get and um, has been allotted by a Supreme Court decree to take water out of the basin for the city's needs. And the Delaware River actually supports about 50% of New York City's water drinking water needs. So even so, and that has that Supreme Court decree of 1931, and it was um, re, got, went back to the court in 1954. And that 1954 decree is still in place today. So how do we all work together to, to deal with the, with the shared resources and these shared problems? So even as early as in 1936, the states got together to form something known as the acronym INCADEL, and that is the Interstate Commission on the Delaware River Basin. 
And they, even in the early 30s, knew that they really needed to start thinking about how to reduce pollution, um, how to develop water supply. You know, the populations were growing. Was there going to be enough water for everyone's needs? And how to um, deal with and handle um, flooding and droughting, flooding and drought in the basin. Um, the Incadel, um, this picture on the left is just from their 10-year uh, annual report from 1936 to 46. So it came out in 46. And the quote in the beginning of it says that the story of Incadel is a story of interstate cooperation. So that is really key here in the Delaware River Basin. And I know I and Garth and um, Carol will also kind of key in on that cooperation that was needed to really manage and work through some of these issues that the basin was facing. And in the late 1950s, um, Incadel, through Incadel, the Delaware River Basin Advisory Committee was created to research the creation of a federal interstate agency to, you know, to move this forward. And what happened was in 1961, the Delaware River Basin Commission was formed. So you see in the picture here, we have John F. Kennedy signing the Delaware River Basin Compact. This was a ceremonial signing of the compact in the White House from November 2nd, 1961. And the compact is our, our guiding and our forming document. And it is law, it's federal law, and it is also law in each of the four basin states. Um, the creation of the DRBC was the first of its kind to have the federal government and all of the state and the interstates work together in a water regulatory agency. So there are five equal members. The governors are the commissioners for the basin states and our federal commissioner is out of the North Atlantic Division of the Army Corps of Engineers. Our staff today is about 35 and we're primarily engineers, scientists, planners, and communicators. So our functional responsibilities are to manage, protect, and improve the water resources of the basin. And we do that through, we have water quality protection um, and improvement regulations, drought management. We, you know, look at flood loss reduction, a lot of water supply, watershed planning, we have a permitting department, and we also do outreach and education and recreation. And one of our early focuses of the commission was looking at the water quality issue. How do we improve the water quality of the river, specifically around Philadelphia? It was, you know, as we said before, it was an open sewer. There were a lot of, of problems with the water. So in 1967, so it was about six years after the commission was formed, they adopted comprehensive water quality standards and they were the most comprehensive of any river basin in the nation. And Stuart Udall was our first uh, federal commissioner. So in the very beginning, our federal representative actually was the secretary of the interior. So here in the, in the picture pointing at the map is, is Stuart Udall. And in 1967, he said that the Delaware basin among the nation's river basins was the only one that was actually really moving into high gear to, um, to combat and reduce uh, pollution in the system. And in 1968, the commission adopted the regulations to implement and enforce the standards that were adopted and created a year prior. And at that time, the Federal Water Pollution Control Administration, now remember this is prior to the, the formation of the EPA. So they said that their Delaware basin is the only place in the country where such a procedure is being followed, and hopefully it will provide a model for other regulatory agencies. So I'm not going to go into the story of the water quality improvement too much. I'm going to leave that for, for Garth. He's going to go into that well. But um, I will just simply say that you know what the problems we're dealing with, there is about a 30-mile area of the river around Philadelphia, Camden, um, that was considered a dead zone. There was no oxygen in the river whatsoever. And you can see on this graph here that pretty much, you know, even up into the early 70s, you know, the dissolved oxygen um, at, at July, the Ben Franklin Bridge was nothing. And we, you know, look and we kind of use the summer July oxygen levels are pretty much typically the worst that you have. Um, so those are the ones that, you know, we really wanted to focus on was getting that oxygen up, you know, in the summer months. I'm um, in 19, you know, the 1970s came the creation of the EPA in 1970. They passed the Clean Water Act in 1972. And these, you know, two were instrumental in um, supporting and investing in the cleanup efforts. And I, again, will leave that, that story to Garth. But as you can see from the graph, by the time we get into the 1990s, you know, the DO levels were above the standard that was set in 1967 and migratory fish have started to return. 
And that is one of the reasons why we're really concerned about no oxygen is that there was no, the, the fish could not breed. So not only did we not have any resident fish, we also couldn't, you know, the migratory fish that, you know, will swim through this area to go up to the upper river to spawn like the American shad and the sturgeon and others, you know, they weren't able to make those runs because they could not get past Philadelphia because there was no oxygen in the water. So another early focus of the commission was flow and drought management. Um, so we, you know, while we were looking at improving water quality, the basin also went into its drought of record. So there was a multi-year severe drought from 1961 to 1967. And you can see here in this picture from October of 1963, that's the Delaware River at Morrisville looking across to Trenton. So this building up here is in Trenton and here we're in Morrisville. And you can see just how low the river got at that point in time. Um, Cox Island Dam, which Tim mentioned, was eventually voted down in 1975, but other reservoirs were built in the basin for water supply, flood mitigation, and recreation. And collaboration, after the drought of 1961 to 67, you know, the water managers got together in the states um, and through that um, Supreme Court decree and realized that the system to manage the water and allocate the water that was in place from that Supreme Court decree wasn't enough in these times of severe drought. So the parties really worked together through the 70s and the 80s on drought management efforts, which we refer to as the good faith agreements of the early 1980s. And a lot of that um, collaboration and work has been in effect today. And the drought management programs that are in place and in, um, implemented by the Delaware River Basin in times of severe drought have been effective that we haven't had to call for any curtailing of water use or anything like that in some of the droughts that we've had to date since the 1960s. So this is a pretty complicated graph. I'm not gonna completely go into it. Um, this, as I said, this could be a whole other topic of discussion, but essentially I did wanna say that here today, the river is still free flowing. There are no dams on the main stem river, but it is highly managed. And you can see here pretty much water, you know, all of these um, polygons here are different um, reservoirs with uh, levels of water that they have for storage, diversions going into the river, out of the river, flow targets that are set up and essentially, you know, today, you know, the management of the river has been very successful to ensure that there are adequate flows, even in times of, of drought. So again, you know, going back to our core responsibilities is to ensure that there is a clean and adequate sustainable supply of water and that the water is also very healthy. So flow and water quality are really um, the core responsibilities of the DRBC. And essentially, you know, what we can do is by bringing all of the parties together and working together through the commission, they can be most effective on this water resource as opposed to, you know, kind of doing it through political boundaries, state versus state. And this is just a little uh, a graphic just to show what all we're into within those that flow and quality. Um, you know, core responsibility. So we're looking at future water use and climate change. Um, water efficiency and water conservation, how to control salinity, manage drought, um, working with um, groundwater protection, um, wastewater discharges, we have a regulatory component, and then also our science component is really, you know, working and continuing on those water quality assessments, really focusing a lot on monitoring, you can't manage what you don't measure, so we have a lot of water quality monitoring and data collection that our staff does. And some of the kind of emerging issues that we're dealing with, like with 1,4-dioxane, um, PFAS, microplastics, looking at toxic pollutants like PCBs, all of this is, is done by the commission. Now, I didn't speak a lot about the other 200 miles of the river. We kind of really focused on, you know, the estuary and the tidal portion south of Trenton. And, you know, thankfully, I took this quote from our 1967 annual report that says, fortunately, the Delaware above Trenton is still a clean river and it is to be kept that way. And I am happy to say that it is still kept that way. And the non-tidal part of the Delaware River is now completely protected by DRBC Special Protection Waters regulations. So even prior to that, in 1978, the upper and the middle Delaware River were added to the National Wild and Scenic River System. That system was created in 1968, so 10 years prior, and it pretty much is a national program to protect 
rivers in their free, free flowing conditions that have really remarkable recreational scenic historical values. So here on the map we have here, this is just, um, here's Trenton. So this is just the watershed. That's the non-tidal portion of the river. And this section right here is the upper Delaware Scenic and Recreational River. This section here is the Delaware Water Gap or the middle Delaware part of the river. And then south of here, this is all parts of this is all the considered the lower Delaware River. And um, in 1992, the DRBC Special Protection Waters Program was adopted for the upper and middle Delaware River. And it essentially is a regulatory program that is to keep the clean water clean. So instead, you know, stricter regulations for discharges, looking at non-point uh, source pollution, as well as looking at the um, communal discharges, not just looking at one and one, looking at how they all interact together. And the goal is to make sure that the water quality in this part of the river does not degrade. It is above standard, it is high quality, and the goal of the program is to keep it that way, is to keep the clean water clean. In 2000, the Lower Delaware was added to the National Wild and Scenic River System, and then in 2008, we designated that section of the river as a special protection waters. So now the entire non tidal <laughs> watershed is part of this program. And here we have clean river in the, in the non tidal river. We're cleaning up and we have, um, we have cleaner river water in the, in the estuary portion and essentially basin recreation. There are so many different opportunities. I'm specifically just gonna talk about the Delaware River Sojourn. This is an educational paddling uh, trip and camping trip on the river. It has happened since 1995. So every year we've ran this trip except for last year. So we're really excited to be able to offer it and be back this year. And it um, is collaboratively collaboratively planned. So I sit on the steering committee and represent the DRBC, but other um, entities throughout the basin. So we work with the Park Service and the state parks in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, nonprofits such as the Delaware, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking, but so nonprofits and individual volunteers. So essentially we have government, we have nonprofits and, um, and individuals working together to plan this trip. Um, the mission essentially is simple. By getting people out on the water uh, through paddling, through experiential learning, we're creating river stewards. So we really think that by getting people out and experiencing the river firsthand, they too will leave the trip with a newfound appreciation for the river and will want to do their part to help protect it. The river, it, the trip is, is family friendly and all equipment and basic instruction is provided. So the Delaware River Sojourn starts on August 6th. It goes through to August 13th. This year, the trip is starting in the very upper river um, where the two branches meet in Hancock, New York. And the trip doesn't, isn't, doesn't take you through the entire Delaware River. It's, we just don't have enough days to do that. But to, so for this trip, we're gonna focus mostly on the upper, the middle and parts of the lower Delaware. Um, I would, the Delaware River Basin has two other sojourns on it that are happening this year. We have the Lehigh Sojourn on the June 26th to 28th and the Schuylkill Sojourn is the 31st to July 31st to August 4th. So there are multi, they are similarly planned and organized and orchestrated similar to the Delaware River Sojourn. So, you know, definitely if you're interested in paddling, if you're even new to paddling, they're all, um, they are all planned you know, to allow people, if you have no experience or if you are more experienced, that you can still all come on and have a fun and safe trip. So now that we, we're talking about Philadelphia and here's a picture of the Penn's Landing Marina um, on a coast day, which is an event um, hosted partially by the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. And you know, the fact that the river has been cleaned up, we can now reconnect to it. And people really want to reconnect to the river and it's just, great to see. Um, the cleanup, you know, around Philadelphia, the river is, is still hailed as one of the world's top water quality success stories. I mean, having started, you know, in the 60s and moving up to now, um, you know, it's been a really, it's been a really great um, thing to see. And, you know, especially in Philadelphia and all parts of the river, you know, people are reconnecting through visiting parks and trails, um, more people fishing, bird watching, um, you know, on water activities like paddling or here you can take out swan boats um, and dragon boats. Um, volunteering, people wanna help, you know, plant trees and do stream bank restorations and, 
um, cleanups and also just learn about the river. People really, you know, are seeing that it's getting revitalized, it's getting cleaner, and they want to reconnect to it. Now, in looking ahead, um, you know, we are still going to be working together. The work is not done. Um, there, are, there is still a lot to do. A lot of those emerging issues that I briefly mentioned, you know, still need, you know, to ha have attention. And, you know, even with the water quality, we've gotten to a point where, you know, where it has improved, but now we're looking at the next phase. You know, can we even further and better improve the water quality around Philadelphia? Um, can we raise those dissolved oxygen levels to maybe also, you know, make it better for fish to reproduce? We have the endangered Atlantic sturgeon in the river, and we, you know, need to um, make sure that the river is clean enough so that fish population can be successful. Um, we have some adult species, but we know that some of the juveniles and um, the young fish need higher levels of oxygen for, uh, six, you know, to survive. So that is what, you know, part of the story that we're looking ahead towards. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, the waters um, are fishable and drinkable and swimmable and equitable for everyone. So we all can do our part to uh, protect and conserve the basin's waters. Uh, the theme of Earth Day today is restore our Earth. So we definitely, you know, know that we can play a role as well as all of you. And it can be something as simple as, you know, saving, you know, saving water, using a reusable bottle, using less plastic, you know, to even some more involved things that um, Carol will be speaking about later on too. So with that, I say thank you very much. I leave you with this aerial view of Philadelphia with the Delaware River up here and it's part of the Schuylkill down here. And I will shop screen, stop screen sharing and will I send it back to Tim or to Garth? Um, Garth, you'll be taking over. All righty. Very much. <laughs> Oops. Hey, wait a sec. Uh, and is everybody seeing my first slide and hearing me okay? All's good. Okay. Yeah, I'm Garth Connor. I work at EPA Philadelphia, and I'm just starting with this because I think this kind of looks, even though this is from 150 years ago, and this is a painting by Thomas Aikens. Here's a guy in a single skull. He's out on the river paddling, and you could see this today in 2021. I, I just, um, I'm going to start with the Schuylkill and end with a, another photo of the Schuylkill, but I, I think this is kind of interesting to look at and think about, you know, 150 years later, and it doesn't look that far off. Um, one thing about the early environmental movement, and um, there was a couple of incidents in 1969. One of the things about... Yeah, I'm just watching. You want your dinner up here? Wait. Yeah. Um, they can't see me. No. Yeah. Wait. Um, so, can you there was a couple of. We. Yeah. I'm good. Okay. Um, there was a couple of bad environmental inc incidents in 1969, and one of them was off the coast of Santa Barbara, what at the time was the largest oil spill. But this oil rig ruptured and it took about two months to stop the leak. But essentially what happened was all that oil washed into the beach and had quite an impact on Santa Barbara. Now remember that Santa Barbara, California, even back then was expensive. My, I have a younger brother who lives there now. I mean, it's a neighborhood that really cares about their beach. Um, one thing about oil when it washes into the shore it really makes a mess and it's difficult to clean up. Um, I work with people who went up to the Exxon Valdez spill. And I think that it takes a long time to recover from an oil spill. Um, it's not a simple thing to clean up. Um, here's a California surfer and look at his board. He got kind of oil stained from being in the water but I think something like an oil spill 
has huge economic impacts. You know, think of the impacts to the fishermen or to tourism or even the wildlife like the seabirds and the seals nearby. There was another incident right after this one near Cleveland, Ohio, where the Cuyahoga River was so polluted that it lit on fire. And I think that those two 1969 incidents led people to the first Earth Day in April 1970. So you had a lot of young, energetic people who really wanted to start improving the natural environment. They wanted to have a, a, a positive impact on it. Um, here's Philadelphia. This is the very first Earth Day in Philadelphia. So it's April of 1970. And this is what was then the West River Drive. It's you know now called MLK Drive, but they closed it for the day. For those of you who are not in Philadelphia now, MLK Drive has been closed for the whole pandemic to cars. So people go out there, I go out there and exercise. But for the very first Earth Day, they closed the drives because you were trying to walk out to Belmont Plateau. And back then, an Earth Day event was a rock concert. And also they had speakers. So they had Edmund Muskie, who later wrote most of the Clean Air Act and was a senator at the time from Minnesota. He was the keynote speaker in Philadelphia. And obviously he talked about, you know, can we do better going into the future? But there was rock music um, at the time, the equivalent to like Hamilton on Broadway was Hair. And Hair was, um, had several cast members who came to the Philly first Earth Day and sang songs. You know, they had, um, there was a group called Redbone, a Native American rock band, and they played. So it was kind of an event. It was orchestrated and put together by University of Pennsylvania. Remember at this point, this is prior to the existence of EPA. We had not started yet. Um, here's some other Earth Days. These guys on the left are from Earth Day, New York City. Notice the long hair, young. A lot of college students were at the first Earth Day. On the right, this is the first Earth Day in St. Louis. I thought this one was interesting because look at the masks. You know, remember some of the people felt that the smog and air pollution was getting to be too much. And so they wore masks to the first Earth Day. But I, I think that, you know, what you have to realize about Earth Day in 1970 is people were really fired up. Um, the father of the first Earth Day was a senator from Minnesota named Gaylord Nelson. And he knew how to inspire young people to get motivated to do something. It didn't have to be environmental. Some of it was an anti-Vietnam War message, but together those two sort of issues got people fired up and motivated. Um, I wanted to show you this picture of Richard Nixon he was the president at the time. He was president from 1968 to 1974. Realized he was a moderate Republican and Congress was Democratic. He was elected on a law and order platform and he was not absolutely thrilled with the whole environmental movement. He was um, a tactician and he knew, you know, sort of how to make different decisions. But like, for example, he created the first war on drugs. He was not really environmental stuff was not on his top three list. Um, Congress inspired by that first Earth Day in late April, they passed a bill to create the EPA and Nixon signed it. So the EPA did come, did start in December, 1970. Um, I Also the Clean Air Act passed later that month. But one interesting fact in October 1972, so two years later, Congress passed the Clean Water Act and Nixon vetoed it. He thought it was too expensive. And um, that veto got overridden by Congress and it did become law. It is an excellent law. I think it had a major impact on our rivers and streams nationwide, um, but it took a while. It was not instantaneous, like October of 1972, it passed and everything was cleaned up in November. Some of the stuff took like a decade to really 
fix, but you know, the goal or the sort of the long-term goal was make rivers fishable, drinkable and swimmable. Um, I have recently swam in the Schuylkill River. I've done um, triathlons in the Schuylkill and people say, did you get sick after you came out of the river from swimming in it? No, I didn't. It's actually quite clean now in you know, 2021. Um, this is kind of an old wastewater discharge pipe, point source dis discharges, which it's essentially like if you have a paper mill and you're discharging wastewater into the river, that's a point source discharge um, or like an oil refinery or a slaughterhouse. When the Clean Water Act passed, they had to get water permits so that their discharge was not eliminated, it was limited. And those wastewater discharge limits are enforceable. I know that's a weird word. Enforceable means if you bust your limit, if you go above your limit and you're discharging beyond what you're limited to, EPA can take a penalty or force you to buy new equipment. But I think essentially what happened with the Clean Water Act is individual facilities had to worry about their discharges. And if they were really bad, the facility was sort of forced to buy new equipment and improve their discharge and it cleaned up the river. Um, there was also federal funding available for major upgrades at wastewater treatment plants. Like in Philly, there was several wastewater treatment plants and they were basically primary, which is essentially all you're doing is letting the solids settle to the bottom. You're not actively treating the waste. So raw sewage could flow through the wastewater treatment plant and end up in the river. As they all upgraded to secondary treatment and the biological activity was attacking all of the waste, it removed the raw sewage and the foul odors from rivers. Pilots would fly into Philadelphia, they'd be at like 5,000 feet above um, sea level and they could smell the river. That's how, how um, bad it smelled back in the day. But I, I really do think that it gradually improved over time. Um, I'm going to show you this picture of a shad. Um, Kate talked a little bit about this earlier. It's a fish that spends some of its life in salt water. So it's in the ocean, but then it runs up the stream to spawn up near Trenton, New Jersey. Um, by the late 60s, there was a 30 mile stretch of Delaware River from about Wilmington to Philadelphia that was devoid of oxygen. Remember that fish breathe, breathe through the gills and need about five milligrams per liter. I worked with a guy. He's now a professor at a university in Philadelphia. When he was a college student, his professor sent him out onto the Delaware River. So this is like 1970. He had a dissolved oxygen meter in the boat, he and another college student, and they were sticking it in the Delaware River. They weren't getting the reading. And they were like, I think our DO meter is broken. It was not broken, but basically you could try to get a dissolved oxygen reading in the Delaware and there was hardly any oxygen in the river. Um, by spring of 1981, so this is like nine or 10 years after the Clean Water Act passed, they held a shad festival up in Lambertville, New Jersey, which is up near New Hope. This is where the shad have to make it up to. And, you know, the dissolved oxygens levels had improved enough so that the shad were running again. Um, I thought I should show the, this picture of L the Lenape Indians. This is like Fishtown 200 years ago, <laughs> Fishtown before the hipster showed up. Um, look at the way the, uh, you know, the, the Native Americans just fished for shad every spring. They were so plentiful, they'd catch them in nets. I think it's interesting that they smoked the shad. Remember, they didn't have refrigerators back then, so they would smoke the meat so they could have it, you know, for a long time. And, it, you know, it provided them as a good protein source. Um, sometimes people will say, was there ever a fisherman in Fishtown? And there really were several sets of fishermen. This, um, these Native Americans were probably the, first fisherman for the shad, but later 
you know, Fishtown became a big fishing neighborhood where there were boats and docks and they caught, you know, millions of shad. Um, this is my final slide. Um, uh, this is a shot on the West River Drive. And what this shows is this is beaver damage. So the beaver, beavers have returned to the Schuylkill River. And, you know, the way this tree is chewed up, there's wood chips on the ground. And um, I'm not sure who did this, maybe the city of Philadelphia. The protect protective fencing is protecting that sapling from the beaver. Um, I did not see the beavers themselves. They're kind of nocturnal. This is probably three o'clock in the afternoon, but I think you could find them if you went out early in the morning or maybe at dusk. But to me, this is evidence that the water quality of the Schuylkill has really improved. And um, we've come a long way in the last 51 years. So to where we're now to a point where we can really talk about um, water quality and is the Schuylkill River fishable, swimmable and drinkable? I really think now it's all three of those. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Carol. Carol's gonna talk a little bit more about this same subject. How's everybody doing? I uh, wanted to say happy Earth Day. Yeah. The, uh, the first Earth Day was very important to me. I was, don't do the math now. <laughs> I was a, a, a freshman at Smith College and it was just a, oh my gosh, moment that I, I became a biology major and um, knew I wanted to get in the environmental field and then I went to University of Pennsylvania for grad school and took a course with Dr. Ruth Patrick from the Academy, uh, Limnology, the study of streams. And I thought, wow, you can get paid for playing in streams? This is for me. And so that uh, set me on my career. She was my mentor for uh, 40 years and uh, had a really you know, I'm just so glad I've been able to be in the environmental field uh, since the beginning. So let's talk about water. And just before we get to the Delaware, I thought this was a really interesting slide that the USGS Geological Survey put together. And this larger water bubble is all the water on the earth. So if you took a straw and just sucked everything out, everything, um, that's how much water there would be. And then if you see the little one to the right there, that's how much water is in a liquid fresh form. That's about 3% of all the water on earth. Then if you look at this tiny little spot right there down around Georgia, that's how much water is actually in lakes and rivers. It's less than 1% of all the water on the planet. So we really need to take care of our rivers. They are a pretty, uh, pretty special item that we have. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, one from a water management side that we need the top down, the regulatory, but we also need bottom up efforts. And as an example of that, I'll be talking about the Delaware River Watershed Initiative that's ongoing now. And then also talk about climate change impacts. And I probably shouldn't stay, I shouldn't say potential because we're seeing them now. So here we are in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I think we're all getting uh, acclimated here where the Delaware River is on the one side of Philadelphia and then the Schuylkill River sort of cuts through. And then here are the intakes. So Philadelphia gets about 60% of their water from the Delaware up in the Torresdale intake. 40% from the Schuylkill 
in two different intakes, Queen Lane and Belmont. And it, the city's really divided. Like if you're living closer to the Delaware, you're drinking Delaware water. If you live um, either in um, you know, West Philly or uh, in the Western side of um, Center City, um, you'd be drinking Schuylkill water. But what we need to keep in mind is where we sit in this basin, because we, we cannot take care of our own water. We've got to work with our neighbors. We've got to work upstream, both we're at the bottom of the Schuylkill River and we're pretty close to the bottom of the Delaware River and the whole basin. So, um, you know, Philadelphia has water treatment plants, but we can do so much more if we have clean water coming down the rivers to Philadelphia. So here's the whole basin and you need those regulators. You need EPA from the federal side. You need DRBC, both from a regulator and a planner bringing everyone together. You need the state regulations, things like in-stream water quality, um, allocation of water supply. So New York City doesn't take everything out of the water, out of the basin and the down basin states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware get their share. But 85% of the pollutants these days uh, are from non-point sources. So you saw the pictures that Garth had of the big pipes that went into the river. Those are point sources. But non-point sources are uh, runoff from suburban yards, runoff from agricultural fields, uh, you know, things that are harder to control. And so those kind of things you really need to work on from the bottom up, working with landowners, working with farmers, uh, working with municipalities. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we control um, smaller land areas that are contributing to the water quality problem. And you saw this, Kate used this also. I mean, think about what runs off of this area during a rain event with cars, dogs, you name it. Um, that's a lot to manage. But then the basin is just so diverse. If you go up to the headwaters of the basin, it looks like this, you know, essentially 100% 100, 100 forested. And in that instance, it's really, really important to maintain those trees and manage them well, because for water quality, uh, flood mitigation, habitat, you name it, forests are something we need and, and also for climate change. So when we look at the basin, there's many different land uses. And the green are those forests I mentioned, and it's really important to maintain those up in the headwaters. The uh, yellowy color are agricultural areas, and then the red are urban areas. So we need to look at all of those. Um, one of the problems we're having is uh, many people are moving up into that forested area and developing more. Um, we're actually seeing a, uh, a real land boom right now with people moving out of New York City because of COVID and moving into the Pocono area. So how do, we, how do we design so that we allow people to come over, but uh, in a way that isn't as damaging? So the William Penn Foundation put together this Delaware River Watershed Initiative uh, started back in 2013. And their whole idea was to work across the four states to really protect this source. So it's a collaborative effort to protect and restore the river and, and really focused on the tributaries. So they're place-based actions focused on on the ground activities. I'll talk about some of these with measurable results. It's, uh, there's a lot of accountability fit in. It's informed by science. The Academy of Natural Sciences where I work now is the lead for the science for the initiative. And there's funding for collaboration. And this is so important because a lot of times if you get a grant, it's for something you need to build or you know, something you can have a ribbon cutting, but there's often isn't money for just getting people together to work together. And um, William Penn has, has been doing that. 
And then it's boundary focused where, you know, what we need to do in the Philadelphia area is really different than what needs to be done up in the Poconos or down in the Pinelands. And so how do we, how do we make that work? They picked four stressors. And um, when you think about it, these are stressors that maybe aren't that easily to manage top down by government, but really do take um, a need to work with landowners, et cetera. So the first is to prevent or minimize forest fragmentation and um, loss of forest up in the headwaters. So where water quality is really good, let's make sure we keep the forest there. Then we have some restoration uh, um, items, uh, agricultural runoff and stormwater runoff from suburban areas. And I saw that Sue Myroff was uh, on the Zoom tonight. She's doing a lot of work in that stormwater runoff. And then finally, aquifer depletion. So how do you get started? You don't wanna just put the money out there for the whole 13,000 miles. Uh, it won't be very effective. So what they did was they asked the Academy, and again, this was back in 2013, where is water quality really good, specifically for those stressors? Where, where is it stressed in agricultural or suburban? So the greener it is, the better it is, the browner it is, the more water quality problems we have. But you can't just base this on science because you need boots on the ground to make this work. So there was an overlay done by the Open Space Institute looking at where, where's the urgency, where's the friction of um, you know, potential development within the basin? Where are the boots on the ground so that there's organizational capacity to do something? And then you know, where's it cost efficient and where can we measure impact? Based on that, there were eight, what we call clusters of subwatersheds selected. And some were selected for protection, like that big green blob up here would be Pocono Kittentinny, where we wanna you know, save the forest along the streams. Out here, Middle Schuylkill is an agriculturally impacted area. Um, this one is Upper Philly suburban, upper suburb, upper suburban Philadelphia. So these are watersheds that drain into Philadelphia that have suburban runoff problems. This really large one is the Pinelands, has both protection and restoration needs, as done the, the New Jersey Highlands. So just an idea. So there, there are eight of them, and each one have, um, I would say the smallest one has four. NGOs, nonprofit organizations in it. Some have up to 15. So you think watershed associations, larger national organizations like the Nature Conservancy, natural lands. Uh, so they're land trusts and environmental organizations. <clears throat> so there are over 60 of these nonprofits working together. There are over 500 water quality monitoring stations, some done at the Academy and Stroud level for um, data collection, some done for citizen monitoring and getting people more engaged in their stream. Almost 20,000 acres of land has been protected to date and over 8,000 acres restored. Uh, William Penn Foundation has pledged 100 million to this effort and they've almost done that now, but it's also each of the on the ground projects requires a match. So it's also bringing money in, into the basin. Uh, there's also a set of what we were calling complementary strategies. So beside the on the ground actions that could be uh, planting trees along a, a creek or a whole farm management or manure management or improving suburban uh, stormwater basins, that type of thing. Complementary strategies are, how do we change policy? How do we do outreach and help municipalities understand the value of environmental ordinances or strengthening them? How do we find those uh, champions in a township? You know, who, who's the uh, resident who knows the supervisor uh, and can make things happen? Things like county open space bond issues, 
et cetera. I don't need to uh, read them all, but so there are a number of ways um, that the initiative is working. Um, over 500 sites uh, for data collection, both biological and chemical habitat. And there's also a number of modeling efforts. So we're trying to make this as cost effective and environmentally effective as possible so that if one of these clusters has some money and they don't know which farmer to work with, they can use some of these environmental models that say if you know there's a it's more cost effective and environmentally effective if you work on this tributary versus another tributary. Um, so there's some good tools being made. So just to sum up this part, um, you know this this has been really interesting to me because I was a regulator at DRBC and I also worked at Pennsylvania DEP. Um, and, and there's there's so much to do from the top down, but I have I've gotten a real um, understanding and appreciation for how much it takes to make things change on the ground and building trust, et cetera. So, and this is focused on your local backyard creek. How do you get people to recognize the value of their streams? So from this aspect, it's very different from what's happening in the Chesapeake where a farmer in Pennsylvania or even New York state is being told, you need to change your farming practices because people want to eat crabs 200 miles south. Eh, the story doesn't work too well. But what we're trying to do is, is say, you know, if we, if we help, uh, help clean your creek or improve your creek next to your farm, you know, maybe your son or daughter could catch better fish there or go swimming there. You know, how, how do we make it something that, that is life-changing for them. Um, backbone of science, we are lucky enough to have this input of dollars. Thank heavens for William Penn Foundation, but it's also bringing dollars into the watershed. There's a whole um, continuing program of adaptive management and evaluation. And there's a group of us called Initiative Stewards. There are 13 of us that have been tasked with looking out past, um, let me back up, William Penn Foundation has said, you know, they're, they'll support this for a total of 10 years. We're in year seven now, assuming the board, you know, uh, is happy. Uh, but then what happens? And how do, we, how do we keep this momentum going instead of just, you know, walking away in 20, uh, 2025, 2026? And so there, there are some recommendations on, on how to do that. And then hopefully we're building that stewardship and love for their local creeks. So that was the first thing I wanted to cover. Now I wanna go into some of these issues that are affecting us. Um, on the, the upper right here, I've listed a number of things that are affecting our basin and, and many others. I crossed out natural gas drilling because the DRBC uh, commissioners approved a ban on high volume natural, on fracking, the uh, gas fracking, um, just about a month ago. So fingers crossed that that will stay crossed out. But we have population shifts, um, you know, moving some in the city, out of the city, water use and energy production, um, issue of how much water should stay in the, in the stream versus how much is withdrawn for human use. The issues of underserved communities, you know, they, they seem to always suffer the most from these environmental issues. And then these emergent and legacy pollutants. And we can all talk about some of these. Now take all those and think of climate change as an overlay. Just making any one of those just more extreme because we're gonna have sea level rise. We do have sea level rise in the estuary area. We are getting more intense storms, which can lead to, to flooding, uh, but that doesn't mean that we won't get droughts. We will also get more severe summer droughts or some droughts. Temperature increases, so a problem with ecology as well as uh, city residents. And then 
overall precipitation increases, but it's, it's not gonna be evenly distributed. So it's not like we haven't had this before. Back in 65, as was mentioned earlier, the multi-year drought, our part of the country was the driest in the nation, this dark cranberry color. And it, it has occurred a couple of times. This is a picture of New York City's second largest reservoir, largest reservoir uh, in 2002, I think it was. It was the lowest it had been since it was built. Pretty scary scene. But it's happened the other way also. Here we've got this blueberry color where we're the wettest part of the nation. This was in 2009, but the um, uh, flood of record was back in 1955. So we have had floods. We had three major floods, 2004 to 2006. This is one of my, uh, I don't wanna call it my favorite pictures, but it's a, it's a poster child. These are the million dollar condos just south of Lambertville that are between the canal and the river. Not a good place to build condominiums. <laughs> but what's, what's significant about this is when you're, when you're developing a strategy or plan of how do you deal with floods, how do you deal with droughts, you look at history. And we only said in the Delaware, wow, we got like 80 years of monitoring history. We're in good shape. But that's not true anymore because climate change is sort of throwing away the data. Um, we can have more severe droughts than we've planned for, and we can have more severe floods than we've planned for. So we're really in a very um, hard to predict area. Another thing that uh, you, know, you may not think of, this is a map of where the red is, is and this was, um, uh, da, da, da. Who was this? The um, the scientist, the climate scientist. Um, I'll find it. Um, anyway, the red is where you would expect to see snow on the ground at least 30 days, and then where we can expect it, say after 2070. And you can say, okay, well, we're going to have a hard time skiing. But what it makes me think of is water supply because a snowpack is a water supplier's best friend. As it melts, it usually melts slowly, fills up the groundwater and the surface water, and we're not gonna have that in our area. As we move down in the estuary, um, uh, the, the working river, the tidal river, we have another problem with sea level rise. And just Tim talked about this, um, here's the estuary, so it's tidal all the way up to Trenton, which actually is where the Piedmont hits the coastal plain uh, on, on Tim's map. So the tide goes, goes back and forth. And remember what I said before, sorry, I'll keep that up there. What I said before about the Philadelphia intakes, keep that in mind. But here with sea level rise, we have an extra problem with, this is the, this is a global average sea level down here. And it's, this is a little bit old data, but it, it's uh, the scale that counts. Uh -oh, is this going by itself? Hang on. Okay. Um, we have a greater rise in sea level than global. And that's because of some subsidence issues as well as ocean currents. And we can talk more about that but we have more of a sea level problem than other parts of the world right here in the mid-Atlantic. And this shows, um, so just to orient yourself, this would be like center city here, Market Street. This is coming down, here's the Schuylkill. So this would be the airport, two feet of sea level rise in a category one, one uh, storm. Um, and it gets worse if you think about a higher sea level. But there's also something else we need to worry about. And that is, remember the Philadelphia intake <clears throat> I mentioned um, back in the beginning, that would be that red dot and New Jersey American has one almost opposite it. Back in the 60s during that drought of record that was mentioned, if there's not enough fresh water coming down the river, the salt from the bay can work its way up the river. 
what we call the salt line. So the drinking water standard for salt usually hangs out around the um, Delaware border, Marcus Hook, that area it goes back and forth depending if it's winter or summer. But in, <clears throat> excuse me, back in the 60s, it snuck up to the Ben Franklin Bridge. And this was some work done by a class at University of Pennsylvania, not a, not a peer review, but just to give you an idea of that, um, um, with sea level rise and a drought of the 60s, that uh, projection could, could get higher than the intakes, more upstream of the intakes in uh, 2050 and even higher at the end of the century. So it's something we need to, to worry about uh, with our drinking water supplies. So I think this is my last slide. One of my favorites since I'm a, a regional planner, adaptation to climate change is now inevitable. The only question is, will it be by plan or by chaos? So hopefully that will give you a, a lot to put into questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That's really interesting. Uh, and thank you, uh, Garth and Kate as well. Um, I, I have just a couple questions. And then um, it's funny, we had, we had talked about asking people to put questions into the chat. And so if you have some questions, you could do that or we'll take uh, hands afterwards. Uh, but Carol, the question I had for you is, um, I know you've been involved in a couple of different roles uh, having to do with interstate or interagency cooperation. And I was wondering, are there certain ongoing, I don't know if we'd say conflicts, but differences of opinion among the states? Like if there wasn't such a interstate cooperation going on, what can you characterize some of the um, differences of, of opinion that you need to work through in that type of a role? Um, sure, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short and, and Kate may want to weigh in. I mean, one of the purposes of the Delaware River Basin Commission is to have the governors of the states take off their state hats, come to the table with the General and the Corps of Engineers to manage on a watershed basis, thinking about what's needed for the shared resource, not not what is needed in Harrisburg or Trenton or, or Albany, et cetera. And that's tough, right? Um, and so there, there are always conflicts. And when you think about the natural gas issue, um, Pennsylvania and New York had the potential for the economic uh, value of the gas. New Jersey and Delaware only had the potential harm, the environmental harm. So that was, that was quite a time of trying to keep people to the table. Um, but, um, you know, there are always gonna be differences, but you just, you know, need to find the common ground and try to keep, keep people working together. Um, there was an instance with uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, and uh, which were very high in the estuary and a reason why you, you shouldn't eat the fish in the, in the Delaware estuary. And we, we brought together the dischargers, regulators, the environmental communities, and it was it was uh, took seven years, but uh, knock on wood, we have a very strict DRBC is a very strict standard and an implementation plan of how to get there. So you know we're not putting uh, industries out of business, but working with them to improve the environment, but um, in a way that uh, is works for the economy. So I hope that helps. And and Kate, did you want to add to that? No, I think that she she answered it well. I mean, when the states came together with the federal government, they not only did they, you know, take off one hat and put on another, they did give up a little bit of their own sovereignty, but they did it because they realized that working collaboratively together for a watershed that is an interstate watershed is you know, is the best way to go about it. And I mean, in that type of thought process back in the, you know, starting even in the 30s and going into the 60s with the formation of the DRBC is kind of ahead of their time. So it is a really interesting concept to work, you know, together with without regard to political boundaries. And that's what they do through the DRBC. And sure, there's challenges. And sure, it's more political at times than you want it to be. Um, but 
you know, they've proven, and I, as Carol mentioned with um, the recent ban on high volume hydraulic fracturing, I mean, as many of us may know, Pennsylvania does allow the practice of, ex, uh, of natural gas extraction in other parts of the state. But Governor Wolf realized and, you know, understood the value and the importance of his hat as a DRBC commissioner that, um, you know, he, you know, voted in favor of the ban in the, you know, in the commit for the commission, because he realized that, you know, it's not just Pennsylvania, you know, it is an interstate watershed. Thanks. Um, I had a question for you, Garth. Uh, it was mentioned in, in the talk that 85% of the pollutants, pollutants are coming from non-point sources, but leaving still 15%, I suppose, coming from point sources. Uh, do you want to point out any of those point sources that we should become upset about? <laughs> and, you know, um, in the early days, they first focused on the point sources, you know, because that's what they were most worried about in their early 70s. And Gradually, they realized that stormwater and non-point source was, you know, having a bigger, bigger impact as they kind of regulated the point sources. But I think, you know, you take a um, typical wastewater treatment plant and, you know, I'll just give you an example. Philadelphia, they're using hundreds of million gallons a day of, of wastewaters flowing into the stream, you know, and a, a large wastewater treatment plant or what they call a major is over a million gallons a day of wastewater. So some of the point sources can be high volume where they can really have an impact on the water quality. I, I do think, I, I kind of agree with what Carol was saying is that as we controlled the point sources, we started to zero in on the non-point. And, you know, you have a farmer in Lancaster and basically, you know, his cows are getting in the small streams and it's flowing down the Susquehanna and having an impact on the Chesapeake Bay. And so I think, you know, as time goes by, we're focusing more and more on non-point. But I, I do think, you know, as someone who's inspected paper mills or, you know, big plants that use, you know, three or five million gallons a day of water, it, it can have an impact on a stream. Tim, can I add something to that? Yes, yes please. Um, Philadelphia and a lot of older cities have something com called combined systems. Yeah. So the storm water from the street, from your roof, ends up in the same pipe as your wastewater. And during low flow, that's fine because there's enough room in the wastewater plant, the stormwater and the wastewater can go through. But if we have a storm event, there isn't enough room and the combined um, stormwater with our wastewater goes directly into the, to the river, um, Schuylkill, other tributaries and the Delaware. And there's, there's a lot of interest now in um, improving the Delaware along the Philadelphia Camden area. The 27 mile stretch in this urban area is the only stretch in the whole 300 plus miles of the river that's not listed for primary recreation. Mm -hmm. And Garth was talking about swim mobility. You know, I don't know how many people will wanna swim in Philly, but it seems like the neighborhoods in Philly should have the same level of water quality as, as the rest. So there's a lot of interest in how, how we can really um, improve these uh, combined sewer overflows so that we can make a better better river for everybody. Carol, I just sent you a, a chat on that subject asking whether you knew whether the city was, so to speak, quote, on schedule with its consent agreement with EPA for the removal of the combined system. Yeah, um, this is the 10th year out of 25 years. Right. And so they'll be, um, they have to do a report, I guess, this fall to EPA. But I, as far as I know, they are on track. I'll say there's also a study being done by University of Pennsylvania Water Center, um, sort of just the facts, ma'am, study of what, what's the situation now with bacteria and pollutants we need to worry about um, with people you know, getting in the river. Um, where will we be after 
the city complies with the EPA uh, consent order. Mm -hmm. And then what else might we have to do? You know, there's still gonna be a gap there even when they, they finish their work um, to get it totally cleaned up. So. Carol, the other question I was gonna ask, and, and somebody's asking a question about non-point source runoff from golf courses, et cetera. When I was chairing PennVest, we had a lot of those non-point source deals that we made to try and protect the Susquehanna going to Chesapeake. Has the RBC or anybody on the Delaware side looked at those kinds of deals where you basically get credit for removing and somebody else can pick them up, the trading? Uh, I don't believe the commission has, has looked at that at this point in time. Um, with regards right now, you know, with regards to looking at um, recreation and um, improving primary recreation, you know, we're really looking at kind of doing the data collection. We're working on that um, water center pen study that Carol mentioned and trying to really see, you know, do, you know, is the quality of the water now, you know, meeting the goals of primary um, recreation? And is your phosphorus or nitrogen concerns of yours? Because that's what's, that's what the Chesapeake Bay is dealing with. with, with uh, the nitrogen issue is a whole is is an issue that we are looking at. That's more of what we're looking at with regards to raising dissolved oxygen levels. So when we, you know, first talked about 1967 and 1968 with um, putting in standards to, um, you know, handle and improve dissolved oxygen, we really were looking at the carbon, the carbonaceous bi biological oxygen demand, or the, for frankly, the, the poop issue with regards to our waste and how to fix that. Um, and that is where, you know, and that took a lot of attention and years and um, investment and we've, and that has been somewhat addressed. The issues where we still continue to have a sag and dissolved oxygen mm -hmm. in the Delaware River and we're, you know, we're looking at it as actually is an ammonia issue. So it is a nitrogen issue, but for, from ammonia mostly. And that actually is ammonia still from us from these antiquated wastewater treatment plants. So the issue in the Delaware with regards to some of the, um, you know, especially around the issues in, in the Delaware around Philadelphia with regards to dissolved, low dissolved oxygen sags and, you know, is actually more attributed to um, ammonia discharges from wastewater treatment plants than say your nitrogen and phosphorus non-point source pollution runoff issues. I'm not saying that they don't exist, but in Philadelphia in particular, you know, you know, from studies that we have done, it's, you know, we're really focused on, you know, looking at ammonia and obviously ammonia has, is NH3 and when ammonia enters the water, um, you know, you for, it can form nitrate and that takes off and that is what is depleting the oxygen from the water. Thank you. I, I see we have two questions. First, Jack. Yeah, Jack. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Milwaukee has been, uh, or Wisconsin has been a fantastic job of turning their sewage into malorganite. And this is not a new process. I can remember buying malorganite in the 60s and using it in gardens. Why is it that uh, some of the other major cities have not been able to take on that stuff? Is it all that expensive for no profit? Or uh, obviously um, Milwaukee is making some profit out of it anyway. I don't know if anybody wants to take that. It's Philadelphia um, did compost its um, sediment from the wastewater plants. And um, I believe they now have a pellet plant, but I, I've sort of been out of it for a while. So I'm not, not sure. It's called sludge, they did. Um, well, and one, one of the problems is that, you know, if you have a lot of industry discharging to your municipal wastewater plant, then the uh, the sludge won't be of a quality that you should use on agricultural right. fields. So you need to you know, right. check that. And this the sludge can get sort of contaminated with heavy metals, and then they're sort yeah. of afraid to apply the sludge onto say a farmer's land because they might contaminate the crops in a certain sense. You got it. Somehow Milwaukee's figured it out. Yeah, I mean, Milwaukee yeah. has got some industry around it also. Yep. And they need the water for their beer. <laughs> I, I do think it's doable in certain circumstances where you, you, you basically need clean sludge that can be used at a farmer's land. You know, um, an example is there's breweries who make beer, 
and they take their waste from their beer making process and they apply it onto a farmer's land where they're going to grow hops and barley, that type of thing. They, so they sort of reuse the waste from the beer making process and then they use it as fertilizer for the next season's crop of, you know, beer ingredients. But I notice how, you know, there's not much metal contamination in that type of thing where you could take it from the beer brewery and bring it to the farmer's land without contaminating the land for the next crop of barley or hops or whatever you're putting in it. It makes me wonder if the uh, sewage treatment was is divided enough in Milwaukee between the residential areas and the industrial areas in order to allow that. Whereas in Philadelphia, there's more of a mix of industrial and residential. So it'd be tough to, to do that. that could uh, be Noilda, I, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but I, I think you have a question. Yeah, you, you said that perfectly. Um, yes, um, I was just wondering, under that 85% um, of non-point source pollution, what kind of activities affect the Delaware water, uh, the, sorry, the Delaware River Basin the most? Would it be um, runoff? Would it be CSOs? Because, um, for example, I work at at Urban Promise in Camden and we paddled the Cooper River oh, yeah. and we see, you know, like a bunch of, um, you know, pipes, you know, that have a little drip on the river. Um, and I was wondering, yeah, would that fall under um, non-point source since it's like there's, there's several of them, okay. um, but also like you said, it, it can also um, come, uh, it can also come from the water the wastewater treatment plant so yeah. i was just wondering it, it does it does get confusing because um you're talking about this the stormwater coming through but in camden as well as philadelphia since there's a combined system it ends up in a pipe so that would be a point source discharge mm -hmm. um and and whereas if you were um say in a, a more suburban uh, township you would have the stormwater totally separated from your wastewater. And it could be, you know, running off somebody's lawn into the local stream. That would be a non-point. You can't, it's not confined. It run, runs off the, the land. Like think of an agricultural field or somebody's lawn. Yeah. So, you know, under that 85%, what would be, you know, more what would contribute the most to non-point source? Would it be agriculture? Um, yeah, it, that really, data, that data? It, it really varies depending on what, what part of the basin you're in. We, we don't have as much agriculture as the Susquehanna, the Chesapeake Bay uh, drainage. Right. But we have quite a lot, especially in Pennsylvania and, and New Jersey. And so that is, that is a problem. But we also think about all the suburban communities we have just around here, but up in the Lehigh Valley, you know, all, all that runs off to the river also. So it's a combination. I'd like to be mindful of everyone's time. We have um, Alice who raised her hand with a question and Jack, I just saw you raise your hand. Um, let's take, I mean, Tim, maybe last two questions and um, maybe people can add them to the chat and we can address them later and get back to you with some answers. That sounds like a good idea, Dee. Okay, okay. So Alice, go ahead, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm in the dark here. I look like Darth Vader, but the lighting's not right. <laughs> but um, my question is for Carol. And you, you talked about having boots on the ground and needing, um, needing to engage some of the local um, watershed associations and local people, agricultural or otherwise, uh, to, to help with the efforts. And I'm wondering what, if anything, what, what sorts of things are being done to engage those watershed associations or local communities in these efforts? Um, you know, what sorts of resources are available to them to support their efforts? 
uh, what sort of engagement is, is going on, connections back and forth, say even between the DRWI and local watershed associations, or how, how that whole effort can uh, be enhanced to make some progress there locally? Sure. Um, I will answer, and Sue Meyeroff is also involved with this, so she may want to jump in. Um, we in Penn Foundation actually funds, like if you're in, in one of those watershed clusters that I mentioned, and you're one of the organizations involved, you are actually getting money from we and Penn Foundation, um, operational money, which is, you know, obviously a great need, so that you can do webinars and outreach and education and have that time to go talk to the municipal officials or even offer technical help to the municipal officials. Um, so that is, that's one of the really uh, big opportunities and, and benefits of this initiative. Uh, so they should be getting money themselves if, if they're one of the organizations involved and they're over 60 involved. Um, Sue is, is with PEC, the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, and they have always done a lot of outreach and she continues that with the initiative. Okay, thank you. Jack? In our area, I live out in uh, Edgemont, which is West Philly, quite a ways. Every spring we have uh, major green thumb lawn doctors, you fill in the blank, all sorts of outfits that come around and treat lawns. Their contention is that they're a profit-making business and don't want to waste any of the fertilizer or other toxins that are put on. Do you have any feeling, any of you have any feeling that that is a better procedure rather than homeowners who really don't know what they're doing, going out to Walmart and buying uh, uh, five bags of whatever and spreading it on their lawn, helter-skelter? Uh, well, I mean, well, we all by probably can, can address that. My, I guess my gut would be, do are you know are they really following their best practices too? Because I don't know about you, but I live in a suburban development, and now that I've been working you know remotely for a year, I definitely have seen the landscape trucks and the people come around, and I'm like, why are you? It's gonna rain later. Like, why are you put you know? And you know, while they say that yes, you know they know better, um, you know they also still have to get you know x amount of jobs in on a certain day. And, you know, I don't think that they would necessarily, you know, be like, okay, it's gonna, we're gonna have a really bad thunderstorm later and it's gonna pour. Like maybe we shouldn't apply chemicals today. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think ultimately it's, you know, on the one hand, you know, they definitely, you know, companies, you know, probably and should and know what's best to do, but whether they follow that all the time I mean, I'm not going to accuse, but I'm just going to question, you know, whether, you know, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, they have to get these properties done and they have to get, you know, it's, it's business. So I'm not sure if they, you know, all, always all the time take into consideration what needs, you know, what needs to be done. Thank you. Tim, would you wrap it up? <laughs> yeah, just as you were um, mentioning that answer, Kate, I, I thought that, um, Perhaps one of the most important thing to address that lawn runoff issue is rather than uh, treating it, homeowner treating it or a company treating it, I think it's the change of, of opinion that a pristine green lawn is, lawn is necessary in front of every suburban house. So it actually begins with individual decisions about you know, what, what's right for the natural environment. So I think um, that's, that's an important aspect. Metal. Anyway, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to thank uh, our panelists for coming today for this uh, really interesting talk. I have more questions in my mind that I'm not, I'm going to refrain from asking. Um, but if anyone, as Dee said, if anyone has uh, any other questions they want to ask, perhaps uh, Dee, are you going to be the, the, the point source for, <laughs> for questions? Mm -hmm. and, um, and you could pass them on to our panelists. I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming tonight and uh, enjoy your Earth Night. Yes, thank you, you. everyone. I, I thank you very much again. Hope to stay in touch. Have a good night. And I'll Bye. be good night, everybody. Recording. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Host you all. And have a good night. Happy Earth Day. Bye -bye. <laughs>
Bye. Bye.